Bobby Handen and Debbie Hillel. We will have a poll posted to get to know you a bit. We, we'd appreciate you completing this poll now. This presentation will be about an hour and a half long. We appreciate and encourage questions and we'll do our best to address all of them at the end of the presentation through chat. Since we have quite a number of participants today, we have muted everyone and turned off video except for the presenters. This class is being recorded. So please like and comment, ask questions. We will post this class recording and slides after the class. Did everyone respond to the poll? If yes, thank you. If not, please do that now. Okay, it looks like our poll, are you a UCE Master Gardener? 63% say no, 38% say yes. And do you have succulents? How many? 22% have tons of succulents. And 69% have few succulents. And I like the last one, I've been unsuccessful, <laughs> unsuccessful unsuccessful keeping them alive, that's 9%. How'd you hear about this class? Newspaper, 6%. Social media, Facebook, 34%. So one last reminder to help improve our program, we'll be sending you a survey via email after this class. We appreciate, we appreciate you attending our class. So, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby Handen. Good morning. It's exciting to, know, to be giving this class. This is the first Zoom class I've given. I've been taking them and absorbing. And uh, my hope is to give that to you. So uh, thank you for coming. And it's, I'm going to try to help the people have a better percentage of being successful with their succulents. Love your honesty. <laughs> so um, to start, I'll just tell you a little bit about me before I tell you about the succulents, which is really why you're here, but just for some background. I've been a master gardener for 10 years. I've had plants, I think forever, because my dad was a gardener. I started with succulents in the 70s. I lived in Las Gatas, California, Bay Area, which has had pretty perfect weather and then moved to uh, El Dorado Hills 11 years ago. And not such perfect weather, but that's going to be part of what we're going to learn today is how you, how you adjust to where you live and help them live. So uh, in the 70s, when I started with succulents, it was a drought. And I had been raising ferns. And ferns are not a good thing to have when there's a water shortage. So. Uh, I turned to succulents and have been hooked ever since. So here's a, some things to get to know the succulents because before you can be successful, you have to know what you're working with. Succulents are water retaining plants endemic to arid areas of the tropics and subtropics. And those plants, uh, one of my favorites, the picture is the are, uh, Imbricata, Echeveria and the really tough and uh, we'll move on now. Next slide. So they have evolved to withstand high temperatures and low precipitation by collecting and storing water in their leaves. And they're masters of survival. And we'll learn to appreciate that more as we go along. So next. Zero fights. If you're gardeners, you know what that means. It means it doesn't need much water. They store water in their fleshy leaves and plump bodies. And they're cam plants, which you don't need to know uh, to raise them, but I think it's kind of exciting to know 
just how versatile they are. So the next slide will tell you uh, what TAM means. It's crassulicean crassulas. You all know what jade plants are, I do believe. So that's the family of, of uh, succulents. Many of them, not all, are in the crassula family. And so it's crassulicean acid metabolism. And next. So they have reverse photosynthesis. I think everybody knows what pho photosynthesis is, uh, where the plants take in carbon dioxide and give us back oxygen. And since we talk about climate change in our lives, just know that they bring in the carbon, which is what we are trying to uh, cut down. So they're very helpful. So because they live, not all of them, but most of them in very, very hot areas. So if they were to open that stomata at the bottom of the leaves, which is how they do photosynthesis in normal plants, they would open it during the day, let in the carbon dioxide, close up, and then do the photosynthesis. Well, succulents, if they, in their hot climates, if they opened up that stomata and that heat, they would fry. And so they've evolved so that the, the stomata open at night instead of the day to preserve the moisture. Just a wonderful adaptation. And what some gardeners do is uh, they water at night. I don't recommend it. <laughs> and the thinking is they're more active at night. The problem is that moisture at night will give you other kinds of problems like mold. Now I have to admit, a lot of the things I tell you, these are fact, and then there's what I do sometimes. So when it's 100 degrees for a week, it feels kind of good to go out there at night and water them, and they do fine, it dries really fast. So just, just to let you know. Um, so we'll move on. And this is what I was just telling you about. I don't have to tell you again. And there's, there's some pretty little echeveras sitting in their pots. Echeveras, you'll see a lot of pictures of those. So these are anoniums, not echeveras, for your information. Uh, one of the problems with a Zoom class is I can't see you. I'm a teacher, but in my real life, or was in my real life, and I give presentations on succulents and love being able to do that. But I usually use facial expressions to kind of give me a heads up. Uh, you didn't say that clearly, or they don't care, or give us a little more information. I can't do that. So I'm kind of flying blind. So uh, I'm going to use a teaching method of repetition, just in case I didn't get through what I think is important. So these are all facts. When I'm just giving an opinion, I will tell you that. Uh, so KYP and KYS, what in the world do you say is that? Next, and we'll tell you. Next slide. KYP means know your plant. Basic, know your plant. You have to know your plant in order to know what you're working with. So their native habitat can be from high elevations, mountaintops, to desert temperatures. Totally different needs. So you really need to know that. And then they have dormancy, dormancy periods, some of them, and not all the same. You think, oh, everything's dormant in the winter. Not so. Some plants are winter growers. Now you're probably saying, how am I supposed to know that? Well, Google is your friend. And once you pick a plant that you like, you need to know the name, first of all, and you need to know where the plant is from and what it needs. Otherwise, you're gonna be giving a desert plant what a mountain plant needs and vice versa, and you're gonna end up with a bunch of pulp. So next slide is KYS, know your space. So now you know what your plant is, and now you need to think about how you're gonna meet that need. If it's a plant that likes a lot of light, and uh, you have to think about whether or not you're really gonna keep it as an indoor plant, and methods of protection, because if it's a plant that's more tropical, then you know that you need to give it some protection 
in this area. I can't ask you what elevation you live at because you can't answer me. Uh, maybe in a question and answer period, we can talk about that a little bit, but you need to know the requirements of that plant. And next. So now you know what your plant is and you know what it needs. So now here are the next really super important things, soil. Obviously they're in some kind of soil. Now I've been fortunate enough, partly through some of the uh, succulent clubs I've belonged to and some of the Zoom classes I've attended to seek plants in their habitat. And you really get a feel for most of the time what really bad soil they're growing in. I mean, don't worry about composting or any of the things you need to make your soil lush for some of your gardens. That is not what they need. In fact, very often they're just growing in rock. And you might not want to do that for purpose of aesthetics, but you can work around that too. They need, so you need, the good, you need your good soil, really important and then drainage. How are you gonna get drainage? Well, you start with a hole in the bottom of your pot. If there isn't one there, make one. <laughs> and we'll talk about pots a little more. And then of course, how much light they need. Very often when you see plants in habitat, they're kind of under a little bush or next to a rock or under a, a larger plant of the same species or a different species. So they're, they're really, not too many plants are in full sun. Watch out when you see that label. If it was in full sun at my house, which is at 1200 feet, they would fry. So you need to think about that. But some plants really just want to not be in very much light at all. And we'll talk about some of those. Uh, so you have to know that. How are you gonna know that? You're gonna Google it <laughs> or whatever. I mean, books are nice too. I happen to have a nice library and I like to look things up, but you need, you need to know. Uh, one of the things that we, I, I would say that all of us do, I know I do. I see a plant and I, oh, I've got to have that. And I buy it and I bring it home and it might not do very well if I didn't know some of these things. Now I have to admit that even though I pretty much by now know a lot of the genus and what they need, I buy it anyway. And then I have to figure out how I'm gonna keep it alive. And sometimes it's trial and error. So, uh, but it's good to have more knowledge. And then light, full sun to part shade. And that's something that's pretty hard to measure, um, but we can talk about that a little more. So next slide. So they need to be moist, maybe <laughs> dry to wet. Some plants you don't want to water, you let them stay dry. And some plants you, you wet your water and not that thoroughly so that they're not sopping wet. And because that's how you're going to, most of the time I would say when people bring me their plants or ask me questions, they've overwatered. So if in doubt, don't. Uh, they're storing water. That's the nature of the beast. Remember, we talked about it at the beginning. So they, they've already got water stored in their leaves and their stems and their um, roots. So uh, if you give them more water than they can handle, they will rot that word again. Correct temperature. Some of them want to be really warm. Um, and some of them, remember I mentioned mountaintops? The ones that grow on mountaintops stay pretty cool. So I tell you one of my uh, failures. Um, I got some, um, people call them hen and chicks. They're Semper Vivum. They're a smaller headed one than the Echeveras. And I was so happy to hear that they didn't mind cold, that they actually liked it because they grow on mountaintops. And this is shortly after I moved here and lost some plants and freeze. So I thought, this is great. I don't have to worry about these plants. And sure enough, they did great all winter. But when summer came, that was the end because it was way too hot here for them. So I, I don't keep very many of them now. I let myself fail 
like three times. And if I killed the plant, three, three different plants, but of the same type, more than three times, it's like, forget it. That's not gonna be my plant. You have to kind of know what your limits are. And so I kept them in shade. If I really wanna keep some and I've gotten them as gifts and they are very pretty. And we're talking about Semper Vivum, that is not this picture. And they, uh, I kept them in the shade in the summer and didn't water them a whole lot. And, and there are some I've been able to keep, but it's not a plant that I have a whole lot of. I, they make me too nervous. Okay, next slide. So more of what they need. So they need, whether or not they, this is not a fact. Uh, with all the sessions I've attended, some people are really hot on fertilizer. I know people that have beautiful succulents and they give them no fertilizer. So I, this formula, the very low nitrogen is one that I have on a bottle that says cactus fertilizer. You can use um, some regular fertilizers if you cut them way back. Someone told me they use azalea fertilizer and they cut it way back, maybe a fourth. That's something that you have to kind of work with, but less is better because they don't have rich soil. And you're not watering them such that that runs out of the bottom and you're washing anything away. So let me just mention the soil again. Um, what I do is I use succulent fertilizer. And then I add about a third pumice to it. You can add vermiculite, but it comes up as you may have noticed with your other plants. So I use pumice and you can buy bags of pumice. And then I also add some red uh, lava fines. It's more sandy. And I find that gives me really good drainage. So the formula, I guess you would say would be, uh, I don't know if this comes out mathematically, but half, half of succulent soil, and then maybe a third of the uh, pumice and just a handful of the red lava fines. You'll probably find your own way, but because I don't have a greenhouse and my plants are outside all the time, it's really important in the winter. I can control the water in the summer and the spring pretty much, and maybe the fall, but when you get into those rains that last for a week or more, you want to be sure if you're keeping them the way I do, that they uh, drain really well. I don't cover them with plastic. Next. Pests and diseases. They don't get a whole lot. The, I, the only time I've had a problem with aphids, and it's not really a problem, is on the flower, which is that lower picture. The aphids will get on it. And usually I can just wash it off with water and take my hand and wash them off. And they don't do anything bad to the plant. Uh, black mold is another problem. Uh, I don't get that a whole lot. And the, then there's mealybugs. And also black mold, you probably can wash off. And uh, if you needed to put a little soap, that would work. Um, mealybugs are the nemesis of most of the succulent people I know. They're, they just appear. And when they appear, they could be on more plants than you can imagine. If you're lucky and you catch it right at the beginning, you can head it off. And that's what I try to do. I just kind of, I love looking at them, first of all. I have to mention that they make me smile first thing in the morning. I mean, I have love to go out and look at the outdoor ones. And then I have quite a few indoors and they just make me smile. So I do look at them and kind of look to see if I see any of that little white stuff. Um, if I do, and I use some, uh, some dish soap like Dove or Ivory, and I mix it with a little bit of oil, could even be salad oil, uh, just a little bit because that helps it stick. And then I'll spray that on. Or 
if I can, if it's the right kind of plant where I can fit it in a tub, in a dish pan, I put that solution in and I swish it around and uh, rinse it off. And that usually does it. I haven't had to use any toxic sprays on it at all. Fungus flies and rot, that's from overwatering. Um, it's not a problem I have had, but the little flies, you can uh, maybe put sand along the roots is what I've heard, the bottom of the stem of a plant, and that would get rid of them. And then of course you always can Google, right? And get some other people's ideas. I love getting ideas from other people and from uh, the internet and from books. I don't always go by them, but it's good to have the ideas and see if they'll work for you. So the next slide. So that was a real problem for me when I first moved here. And I knew you weren't supposed to put plastic on plants. Um, they said you can use sheets, but they get wet overnight and you can't let them sit in there hanging on the plant. Well, they have these wonderful uh, frost cloth or row cloth. And the particular ones in this photograph were the ones I got at the bit beginning of my succulent uh, adventure here in El Dorado County. And those fold down um, and they're the same frost cloth and they made a huge difference. Now I use the same fabric, but it comes in a roll, which you're probably familiar with. And I just lay it on the plant. And because I have them in a gravel yard, many of them are on concrete, I have no way to fasten it except lay rocks on the edges. So I'm still kind of primitive in the way I handle that. I guess there's other things you could do. You can make a frame or you can, uh, it comes with little metal things that you can put in the ground to hold it. Uh, but I just throw them on. My plants, by the way, I do not have a greenhouse. Uh, my plants sit on the ground, which is what you're not supposed to do. They should be up off the ground on bricks, but I have way too many to do that. So I, uh, just throw the frost cloth over them. My yard kind of looks like Halloween when we've had a lot of frost. And you can buy them at the big box stores or the nurseries. You can send for them online to garden stores. Um, and those particular ones fold for easy storage. So I use them for certain plants that are, that are bushier, but mostly I now use spread them out. So uh, Mentioning stores brings me to the fact that here in the pandemic, um, my husband and I don't go to stores. We have everything delivered to the trunk of our car and I've lost some of the joy of shopping for plants, but I do it online. But you have to be really careful because I accidentally this year ordered some plants in April because, you know, March, was the beginning of not going out. And by mid-April, I was really getting kind of antsy for new plants. And so I went online and ordered some. I did not notice that it was coming from the Ukraine. One of them came yesterday, <laughs> was really no plant left. It was just dust. So you can order online. There's some really nice nurseries and you can do really well, but you have to be careful. So next slide. So these are some different uh, kinds of uh, actually cactus. This is a mammillaria, very beautiful, um, not hard to grow, just don't overwater them. And next. Gasteria. Now, Gasteria is really a lovely plant. If you're a beginner and you don't have a lot of plants um, and you want to add something, they're really a good house plant because Gasteria, they're related to Herworthias and aloes. Um, and they don't want a lot of light and they don't want a lot of water. And just don't bother them too much. Just let them sit on your windowsill, not in the sun, or on your table or hang them up and they'll grow and they're beautiful. There's a big variety of them. Mine 
are mostly outside in the shade and they're covered in the winter. Um, they don't get a lot of sun. So next. Aloes, big variety of aloes. Uh, just a couple pictures of them, native to Africa, also related to Haworthia and Gasteria, and well-drained soil. They all need well-drained soil, but some of them are fussier than others. And next. So I have to tell you about this plant. It's really beautiful, right? My daughter lived in Southern California and moved into a 75 year old log cabin. And there was this big old gnarly J plant, which is what this picture is sitting on a hillside. And she said, I just hate that plant. And finally, after a few years, I said, why don't you water it? It'll really be prettier. So she watered it and this is what happened. Just beautiful. And I'm lucky enough to have some cuttings from it. Not hard to make cuttings from Crassula. Debbie will tell you about that. But they do freeze in the winter. So you have to cover them or put them, you could put them against the building. Um, if there's an overhang. Um, and mine are outside and they're, they're fine, but I do cover them. So next. Now you're looking at my favorite plants. These are sense of the area. And I don't know if you can see behind me, there's some sense of the area on the kitchen counter. These are more unique. Most of the ones you see, you call mother-in-law's tongue, right? And they are sense of the area, not sense of Vera, not sense of Vera, it's sense of the area. And you can see how different these are. I think they're very beautiful. And they're one of my favorite plants and I'm, they're inside. I have about more than 20 of them in the house, kind of on the, in the hall along the walls. You see them in shopping centers, not just fancy, but the uh, regular mother-in-law's tongue, which is fasciata. And uh, they don't need a lot of light, but they want light. And they're, they just give me a lot of pleasure and they're not a lot of work. And moving on. So these are sedum, they're really plentiful. And they're, they make good ground covers. You all probably, if you have any succulents, there's a good chance that you have some sedum. The general term is stone crop. This one is uh, sedum spathifolium. By the way, um, <clears throat> once when one of the evaluations at one of my talks, somebody was criticized me because I was being so fancy using these Latin names. There are no other names. <laughs> There's a few nicknames like Hen uh, um, and Chicks, which is totally incorrect. Don't use it. And there's Mother-in-Law's Tongue. You can use that if you want. But most plants are genus and species. And you really want to know that because if you're looking it up and you're looking up, well, Mother-in-Law's Tongue is a bad example because you would find it. But a lot of these little nicknames they give you won't find it. Or if you're talking to somebody and trying to describe a problem and tell them what plant you have and you say, well, it's, it's the gray leaf one. It's not gonna be helpful. You really, really need to get the name. So I'm not just showing off with names. This is the name of that plant. There is no other name. And they like sun and good drainage. And remember full sun, you're taking their life in your hands here. Next. So everybody's probably had one of these, right? The zygo cactus. And uh, there's Christmas cactus and Thanksgiving cactus, and you can tell it by the leaves. I really have to study it to do that. But I guess you know that you really, like now, this time of year, you wouldn't be watering it. And you wouldn't have it have a, you would have normal light during the day but they want, they probably want eight to 12 hours of dark. So I have mine in a guest bathroom that doesn't get used that often. And that's where this one was and it just blooms its little head off. Beautiful plant, not too much water or they, they come off their roots, literally. And next, now this is kind of a treasure to me. Uh, with all the years and all the succulents that I've had, 
this was totally new to me. A friend of mine sent me a picture and said, what is this? I get a lot of those. Sometimes I know, sometimes I don't. This one I didn't, but if you look at the flower, it's uh, some kind of ice plant. I knew that. And so I looked at different ice plants, um, Delisperma and some of the others and wasn't it, but somebody else found this uh, trial and error. And so of course I had a habit because I didn't have one. And it doesn't look like that yet. But the neat thing about this plant, it has a caudex. A caudex is the, the stem part below the ground, like part of the roots that gets very thick. And when they get old enough and you repot them and lift them out, sorry, I don't have a picture. It um, looks like a bonsai. It just has this big, thick trunk on it of beautiful wood. So mine right now is like three of those little strands and it keeps blooming. It's just lovely. I'm really excited about it. And I got it online and I, I got it. It was a grower in California. That's probably your safest thing, um, but definitely not from the Ukraine. Next. So if you want to keep them as house plants, they're the same rules. KYS, remember that was know your space and know your plant. And many succulents do well in the windows. I think, so there's a little sense of the area. See that down at the bottom. And those really don't want much water. They'll fall apart. But they, with the other pictures of sense of the area I've shown you, um, they, they do very well in the house. In fact, I don't put them out because maybe sometimes in the summer in the shade, but uh, they'll freeze in the winter. So um, there's your cautions. And next, next is Debbie. So Debbie, do you wanna tell them about you? Maybe. <laughs> or not. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> It's, it's Bobby. I don't know if you guys are laughing or um, crying. I like to watch the facial expressions that you have that I can't really see. So I'm going to talk about one of the easiest plants to propagate and it's succulents. Um, this picture that you see right here is, um, oh, Bobby, you're going to have to help me with the name on this plant. It's an echeveria. But all they did was they took a little it's an echeveria and I took um, one leaf and put it in a six pot, a six um, cell, like you get at the big box stores and this is what happens. And pretty much I just ignored it. Um, luckily enough, I have a greenhouse. So I would put something like this in my greenhouse over the winter and lo and behold, come spring, this is what I can find. Um, <clears throat> I also live at only, I'm only at 700 feet, so I don't have a whole lot of um, frost problems and my greenhouse is unheated. So let's go to the next slide. So there's two ways to propagate succulents. You can either use seeds or cuttings. Next. Oh, okay. Um, you always, when you're doing succulent propagation, you always take cuttings from clean, healthy plants. You don't want to uh, use a plant that has the mealy bugs or any insects on them or anything that's been overwatered and it looks like it's dying. So you want clean, healthy plants. You would take cuttings and sow the seeds at the approximate, at the approximate time of the year depending on the growing of the particular plant. Personally, myself, if I have a succulent piece that falls apart, uh, I will just pick it up. It doesn't matter the time of the year and put it in a pot and nine times out of 10, it will grow. When you're uh, using um, tools, you make sure that your tools are always clean. You can use saws, pruners, knives, etc. My thing that I just use is I usually use a, a very small clippers or my fingers. You know, if you're using like a jade plant, all you need to do is just pinch off a leaf 
and pot it in the soil or put it in the soil. And another thing you need to do is um, if you are going to do a, um, an extensive amount of propagating on a particular plant, then you wanna make sure that you have everything ready um, as far as your tools, your potting mix. And another good important thing to have when you're doing propagating is a label. Make sure you label everything because lo and behold, as I know for myself, you will forget what it is three or four months from now. All right, next slide. Okay, you can do seed propagation. It's very inexpensive. You can look online, you can get seeds from a lot of different places. It's probably a good idea to get them from someone that you know specializes in succulents. You know, you can look at their websites um, and the comments that people make on the seeds. So it's inexpensive, that's the one good thing. Normally you don't need a greenhouse. You can usually start the seed inside. You will get, it's hard to tell on this slide, but you can get numerous plants. The thing with seeds though, is that you might not get the exact variety of the plant that you're looking for. So if there's something that you have your heart set on, I would suggest doing um, cuttings. Uh, next. Some of the seeds are very, very tiny. You know, you can barely see them when they come in the package. Some are large, as this shows here in the pictures. And here's the part that I do not like about seeds because I am not a patient person. They can, some seeds can take up to a year to germinate. And for me, that's way too long. You know, maybe after two or three weeks, maybe four weeks, I'm thinking, well, this isn't gonna grow. I lose patience and usually end up throwing it out. Next slide. The seed basics for succulents is pretty much the same seed basics that you would do to plant any other seed variety. Um, it says mid spring on this particular slide, but you need to read the label on the seed packet or wherever you get the seeds from because the people that sent you the seeds normally know the best way to plant the seeds. Uh, you can use individual pots that are at least one and a half inches deep. You can reuse pots. You can use um, pretty much anything to start seeds. You know, I'm thinking like the, um, when you go to the grocery store and you get salad or lettuce in the plastic containers, you can use those. You could use yogurt cups. There's a, anything that you can put soil in and you can water uh, sh would be a good thing that you can start seeds in. Also use an all purpose seedling mix. And the reason I say this is that it's a little bit lighter weight, not quite as heavy as some of your other mixes. And the other thing is that you do not want to use anything that has um, a fertilizer in it or even a feeding because sometimes when they put fertilizers in a seedling mix, it will kill the seedlings. And seedlings get their nutrition from the actual seed itself. So they don't really need to be fed until they get their um, first true leaves. You would keep the temperature for your seedlings between 60 and 70 degrees. You need to keep them moist and then you can cover them to keep the moisture in. And this is pretty much your basic seed basics for most any seeds that you plant. Next slide. Here's a, a suggestion of way you can um, do your planting, but like I said, you could use an egg carton, um, pretty much anything that holds soil. You wanna make sure that you keep the soil mix damp, but again, I recommend that you read the label different uh, seeds have different requirements. Some of them need to be watered to start, but then no water at all. So always read the label. And again, like I had said earlier, you always wanna label the pot or the propagation tray with the date that's sown, the botanical name, and where you got the seeds from in case they don't grow or you really like them and you can ask them again. Um, it's important to write down the date 
And the reason this is for the ones that take years to grow, I mean, excuse me, months to grow, you have an idea when you planted them and you have an expectation as to when they should start growing. Uh, typically also on your seed packet, it will tell you how long it takes for these um, seeds to start growing. You also need to keep track of your successes and your disappointments. It gives you an idea of what seeds grow well for you and what seeds won't grow at all for you. Next, please. Here is the easiest way to propagate succulents. You take cuttings from healthy plants, which we had talked about. You take cuttings at the start of the growing season. Now, here's the deal with succulents. Some of them have a winter growing season and some of them grow in the summer. So you, it, back to what Bobby had said, know your plant to see what it's growing season in. And then another thing is that you need to decide whether to cut individual leaves or um, a larger cutting. And this over here on the left, you, on, you can order online cuttings and pretty much on the left is what you can order online and they'll send to you. And these are all bare root. And all you do when you get them is you get a little pot of potting soil and you can put each one of these plants in a little pot and within a matter of maybe one to two months, they'll start growing for you. Or you can do the leaf cuttings like the picture on the right. Alrighty, next slide. Okay, the way you do the leaf cuttings, you strip the leaves from the lower part of the stem. Now this is, root, rooting hormone is optional. Personally with succulents, I don't typically use a rooting hormone. You can, some people say that it helps um, make the rooting quicker. You know, it's kind of up to you whether you wanna use it or not. The next is that once you um, pull off the leaves, this also is kind of up to you. Some people let the leaves dry out for a day or two in a lightly shaded location before they put them in the soil. Other people can just pick the leaves off of the plant, put them in the potting soil, and just pretty much, you pretty much ignore them. I have a friend who did a, um, if you think about a clay pot saucer, and she took that and she filled it up with soil and she took a bunch of cuttings from various succulents, put them in the dry soil, didn't went water them all winter, put them in her greenhouse and the next spring she had baby plants. So somewhat it's kind of a, a hit and miss type of thing if you're, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So that's again why you wanna make a note of what works for you and what doesn't. Um, for leaf and stem cuttings, you can use a succulent potting mix, uh, which you can get at the big box stores, or you can make a mix kind of like what Bobby told you earlier. Typically with um, cuttings, you select a, an appropriate pot size. So you wouldn't want to put one little um, jade leaf in a, um, in a one gallon pot. Um, and you see, select appropriate pot size and then plant the cutting and the leaf into the little tiny pot. Next slide. Okay, so after you get, here we go with, again, things that work for some people. Now, these are the rules. I think Bobby mentioned before, there are rules of what you're supposed to do. And then there's other things that you can try on your own. It says to place the plant in a warm, airy location, 68 degrees. These are kind of guidelines. Keep the soil slightly moist. Some plants will root without hardly any water at all. Reduce the watering as plants develop and use fertilizer cautiously. And kind of, again, back to what we talked about originally is that they usually don't need very much fertilizer at all. You know, if you use the um, red lava finds, some people say that you don't need to fertilize them at all. Next. And last, we're gonna talk about um, 
making succulent gardens. These succulent gardens are one of the easiest things you can make. And if you notice here on the left, I was at my local Safeway and it was probably a year or so ago. Look at the price on these. This is like a, a mason jar, has a little bit of um, charcoal in the bottom, a little bit of sand, a little bit of potting mix, and then succulents are put inside. And you can get cuttings from friends, family, um, you know, you can buy bunches of cuttings in lots and make your own. And I'm pretty sure it's not going to cost you $22. When we are able to get back together again, Bobby and I usually host a class where you can um, make little succulent bowls. Usually like little tiny glass aquariums. Think if anyone used to go back in, um, when you used to go to the fair and you'd put the ping pong balls into the goldfish bowl, that's pretty much the size of this bowl. And again, you would start with charcoal on the bottom, a little bit of sand, some potting mix, a couple of succulents. You could put in rocks, you can put in colored rocks, you can put in little fairies, um, anything that you want to make it decorative. And over here on the last picture here, these are, um, little pumpkins that Bobby made that you can put succulents on. So pretty much all she did was put on some uh, moss and then you can hot glue the succulents onto the top of the pumpkins. I think, next slide. Ah, and sources of inner, uh, where you can get information Uh, you can get information from the nurseries. There's tons of specialty books. The internet, Google is your friend to make sure that you are getting good information, especially when it comes to pests, is to make sure that whatever you Google, you use a .edu at the end. And that is um, typically a university or a school that has tested these um, individual pest requirements or how you get rid of the pests. So I think Bobby and Ruth, I think we're open to questions. Okay, there's a few questions in the chat room. Debbie answered a couple of them about the white stuff, white stuff that was on, uh, that was on uh, Bobby's thing and Debbie said mealybugs. And then when you cover your plants in the winter time, do they still get water? Do they still get water from the rain? Yes, they do get water from the rain. Can I and, uh, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. When you cover them with the things that the, the Bobby told you about, the, uh, the cloth or the white containers, you do not need to take them off either. So you can keep them covered all winter long and not have to worry about taking, putting them on and taking them off. They dry very quickly, the fabric. And another one from Shauna, any tips for keeping rodents from eating your succulents? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't have that problem. And this cloth might be scary to them. I don't know. I haven't had my my muted or my on. You're on. You're on. Yeah. Um, so otherwise, um, I guess you could cage them. You could put wire caging, and keep them out. You know, bend it like a, a um, like a cage. Just some loose wire it would have to be in the ground. I'm thinking. So hope that helps. Okay. Uh, question from Claudia. How do you cut the succulent? Um, I think we kind of went over that a little bit. A lot of times you can just use your hands, uh, a small clippers, um, depending on the size of the succulent, but most of the time they'll be a soft stem. So you can just use your fingers to clip them off. Uh, Another question from Pamela, how do succulents rate in regard to deer? Do deers like succulents? 
Well, there's always the thing of your deer and my deer. You know, I in, in general, when I read about the succulents, they're not that attractive to deer. They say especially the gray colored ones, um, but there's always the babies that are gonna try something. But I wouldn't say that they get wiped out by deer. You know, they might taste them, no promises. Another question, I have plant, I have plant cuttings, not leaves that have dried out and ha have been sitting for a couple months. Do I need to cut them again or just plant them? Good question. Do they look like they're still alive? Yeah, I was thinking that. Um, sitting a couple of months. Sometimes they'll have air roots on them. It's hard to, you know, what they look like. I would say if you have a bunch of them, I would take some of them and I would cut them and plant them. And the other ones, I would just plant them and I would just kind of do half and half and see what works for you. Okay. Uh, another question. I'm confused on watering cuttings. Keep the soil most moist or leave them alone until they start growing? Good question because yeah. I, <laughs> Yes and no. It depends again on the particular plant. If the plants are nice and fat and juicy, then, you know, um, I'm trying to think what I would call it. If the, the cuttings are nice and fat and look like they have a lot of water in them, then you don't need to water them very much. So not really, and I see the next um, rule of thumb, how much water, again, it's just pretty much check the, um, the plant. There is a good book. It's called, um, it's a propagation book. So I would check with, um, in a propagation book or online to see what they say. It depends again on the plant. And there's a question about frost fabric about, and you, and then, uh, Bobby bought, bought a roll of it. So what, what the question, where to get it or what it is? or What it is, I think, I believe. Well, yeah. it's frost fabric. It's, um, sometimes it's called row cloth. Uh, row cover. I, I, yeah, row cover. I enjoy some of the uh, gardener catalogs and they would be in there or you could just go to a box store and ask for it. But uh, pretty much it would come in a roll or it might be flat might not be round, it might just be folded fabric. Easy to cut with scissors and uh, you just open it and throw it over the plant. I think the next yeah. question is about watering. Is it, I think such as, is it kind of like one tablespoon of water per inch of height for your succulents? It's pretty hard to answer. Um, would depend on your soil, on the humidity, um, what the root structure is of your plant. Um, I would say that's not very much. I mean, you could be a little more generous, particularly in warm weather. In winter, don't even worry about it. Mm -hmm. But in uh, summer, when it's hot, you could add more water than that. It'll, it'll, if your soil is good, it, it will dry out. I mean, don't be afraid of the water. Just don't drown them. Yeah. And how to how how do you prevent excessive growth of succulents? I don't know. Is there such a thing? <laughs> I'd like them to grow. You can clip them. You know, um, it's nice to use the clippings the way Debbie told you and propagate them, but you can trim them. They're it's, it depends on the kind. Uh, for instance, if you have echeveras, which are the little look like roses, the little heads that clump. Um, you can get underneath and, you know, if it's too thick, um, you can get underneath and just cut off the stem where it uh, joined right above the soil. I don't know if that's what that person means. Yeah, so one's about, next one's about, I think goes back to the above that Debbie was talking about. If the roots, roots are dried out, is the plant still alive? You know, can you water it? And I think 
it will move. The, the roots are dried out. What I'm talking about on that roots are dried out is that typically, or sometimes there'll be air roots that grow from plants that have just been left out. And they're like tiny little hairs, gosh, pieces of thread um, that could be hanging from the plants and then you can plant those. So kind of like I said, I would just take the plants that you have, split them up, the ones that you've had out for a while and plant some of them and cut some of them and see what you get. See what happens, yes. Is the watering requirement different for leaves versus cuttings in regards to propagation? Not really, no. Then have either of you used neem oil for mealybugs? Well, I start with water, which is the least offensive as far as the environment goes. And then I go to soap and some salad oil, but you could put the neem oil in with that diluted. Succulent, sometimes they uh, stain, so to speak, that leaves a mark that won't go away. So you wanna be really careful. If you do use straight neem oil, don't use it straight, add water to it, thin it down. But you could use it with the soap in very, maybe in drops. Okay. What can I use to pr protect against excessive rain? Well, you can put it under an overhang or under another tree. Um, the frost cloth doesn't stop the rain, but I think it keeps it from puddling. I haven't had an issue with it. There is a fabric that I can't think of at the moment. Debbie, can you, the one that's green and you can buy it at the box store and it's meant for plants. You can't leave it on because light doesn't come through. With the uh, frost cloth, depending on what kind you get, you, you can get like 80% of the light and you can keep it covered as Debbie said. This other cloth is, um, is dark green and no light comes through. No light comes through, but you can, if it's one of those drenchy rains, you can throw that over it, um, but you have to pick it up again in the next day. But uh, most of the time they can take the rain. You know, if your soil is good and it drains, and you can tell by looking at it if it's drained. If you see little puddles, um, not good. If you have a saucer underneath, get rid of that. You don't want anything under it that's gonna hold the water. And also, should I use tap water or distilled water? I just use tap water. Some people use distilled water. That's one of the things that fact or opinion. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can use distilled water, but you don't have any minerals in it, so I don't know. Opinion. <laughs> I use tap water. Some people store rainwater. That's the best because I think it's a little acid and they like that. Um, Bobby, could you repeat your soil formula? Well, I didn't really give you a, a formula because I, I do my fertilizer the way I cook, you know, a little of this and a little of that, <laughs> whatever looks right. But um, it's at least half of the succulent soil. You don't want to use garden soil. It's too heavy. So the succulent soil, and if you read the labels on them, they already have, they have some sand, maybe. Um, they have some peat moss, maybe. And I try to get some that does not have that. And it usually has uh, pumice in it and maybe some other kinds of lava. So you use a succulent, at least half succulent soil. And then you could use, um, then you use the pumice um, and then uh, a little bit of the red lava. Red lava finds, if you, they're very good. I love using those, but they can clump if you use too much. So you can't do any harm by adding too much pumice. I have gotten plants that I've purchased that are planted in pure pumice. And I've talked to growers that do that. It offends me to do that, but it's probably more like in nature when they're growing in rock. So I hope that helps. Good, then, then going back to the question about excessive growth, 
Uh, she chatted back and said that her succulents get very tall and slim and the leaves are spaced apart. Okay, that sounds like etoliation to me, but I haven't seen the plant and I don't know what the plant is. Etoliation is when a plant doesn't have enough light, it kind of spreads mm -hmm. out and it gets leggy, I guess would be the word that I would use. So if that's the case, you might want to change the way you're growing it. You might want to give it a little more light because they usually they're pretty compact. But then I don't know what your plant is. So it's the best I can do for you. And another question. I have a mother of thousands. I have not been able, ha have not been successful in getting any of the numerous babies to grow. Once they send out roots, I miss them, but then they die. Am I just being impatient and watering too early? So that's a Kalanchoa and they're very beautiful. And uh, usually I just let the babies stay on the plant because I think it looks really pretty, but you can cut them, maybe cut them in a cluster if you can, and then water carefully. Okay. Or maybe not water at all. Mine just oh, usually wow. start yeah. to grow right up, right below the plant. At least don't water them for a while. Yeah, anytime you plant something new, and I think you said that with your cuttings, and you, you just you don't need to water them. Uh, so that's a good point. And also, is there a resource, or and either of you available later for succulent questions? I think we only have a certain amount of time, right? Uh, you, you could reach either of us through Master Gardeners and ask your questions and they'll contact us and then maybe we can directly contact you from that. But I'm always happy, I love talking about succulents, so it's never a problem. So up on the screen now is the phone number and our email address. And, and you could address it to each of us or both of us uh, and, and ask your questions and then be happy to answer. You could also, we have a, um, a Facebook page that uh, you could post your question on Facebook and they can contact us. And then you'll also get a lot of other answers from other people who have had successes or failures. It's just a number of thought if you are on Facebook book or Instagram. So that's all the questions that are in the chat right now. Is there any questions that you had, uh, Bobby, that you would like to you know, answer problems that you have had and words well, of wisdom, Debbie, words of wisdom? I'd like to point them towards the different organizations. Debbie and I belong to some of them. And we go to meetings and learn a lot about plants and hear what other people have to say. One of them is the Sacramento Cactus and Succulent Society. Uh, they have meetings. I mean, they may be starting to have live Easter. meetings. Pardon? And then the CSSA that I told you about, I just joined that since the pandemic, <laughs> uh, just find them a wonderful source. If you join, you get little booklets and um, the presentations every other Saturday just are very exciting to me. And I've learned a lot, you know, hearing these are really, these are professional growers that have a lot of experience and very successful. And so I enjoy that. And then uh, the other one is, uh, What's it, Debbie? It's not Citrus Heights or Cameron Park. It's Carmichael. Carmichael. <laughs> and that's another organization that they have meetings. Uh, and there's people there. People love to talk about their plants. So that's a really good source. And the other good thing about these groups that have meetings is that not only do they love to talk about plants, they love to share their plants. They do. <laughs> <laughs> and they have raffles too <laughs> but 
but not now, I don't think. No. Bobby, there's a question. What is CSSA? I don't know that either. Oh, I thought I said it at the beginning. Cactus and Succulent Society of America. And it's been around a long, long time. And, and I had belonged to it many years ago and kind of forgot about it. And now with being in so much, um, I keep reaching out to find new ideas because you always learn something. There's always some new thing to learn, some new thing to try. It, it's like with your soil, you'll come up with your own, uh, own uh, formula, so to speak. So there's another question that came up. What does it mean when my string of pearl, pearls leaves shrivel? Can it be due to excess and or insufficient watering? I don't I know. Leave that one for you. Yeah, thanks. I've never grown them. So is it sticky, I'm wondering? Is it something that aphids got into? Um, it's not something I know, but... Um, Google it, <laughs> see what you get. Yeah, I can never get them to grow for me. They always die. That's not my, the birds get them if they grow. So I just, mm -hmm. you know, you have to know what you can grow. I mean, with all the experience in the world is, I don't know anyone that doesn't say I can't grow that. Maybe I can't grow that, but Debbie can, or maybe Debbie can't grow it and I can. And, you know, you talk to different people and say, oh, I can never grow that. Um, it's just whatever your environment is, whatever your sub climate is where you live, uh, your style. Some people can't stay away from the watering can. Uh, so uh, you try it and, you, and you, as I said, I think I said at the beginning, I, I give it three, three shots and then I'm done. It's like, okay, let somebody else grow this. There's a lot of nice plants out there. And the ones I'm really successful with Obviously, I have a lot of them because I love watching them grow. And then someone wanted to know what the name of the Carmichael, Carmichael Club was, and someone answered the Carmichael Cactus and Succulent Society. Good, but, yes. Perfect. But that they aren't holding meetings right now. Yeah, none of them are. When, well, it's kind of interesting because my last, this past Saturday, my meeting with the CSSA, they were saying, how much they love the Zoom because you get more people to come and, and hear what you have to say and to learn about succulents and you know have the interest grow. And it's very convenient to pick up my cup of coffee and my breakfast and go sit in my den and have somebody else give me a class, things that I don't know about. I go to Australia via Zoom. I've gone to, um, where was the last one? I can't think, but just different countries and seeing things in, in nature and hearing what other people have to say. So they're saying that Zoom is here to stay, that they'll supplement and have regular meetings eventually, but they're gonna continue with these Zoom classes, which makes me very happy actually. Oh, you else? see that question there about what is Sherwood? Oh, I could have said There's a class on that, Debbie. Do you want to tell them about the demo garden? I think that must be what they mean. Okay. Right? Yeah. Right. It's the Sherwood Demonstration Garden. Um, I'm not sure where you are, but it's a demonstration garden up in Placerville. If you go to the Folsom Lake College Placerville campus and you drive all the way through the campus to the end, we have a demonstration garden there in the back. Um, we have a succulent garden, we have a children garden, a children's garden, roses, um, perennials, <laughs> butterflies, uh, tons of different gardens in a garden that you can walk through. I noticed Tracy just put the um, address on. We were open on Fridays and Saturdays noon to, no, wait a minute, sorry, nine, nine to noon. But I thought I saw recently, and Tracy, I know you're there. Are the hours changing at the end of this month? Starting November 1st, we'll be open nine to noon on the first and second Saturdays of each month through April. And the succulent garden, which is me, 
Um, I'm chair of that. I'm there every second Saturday, just sitting there with handouts, waiting for you to come and ask me questions. Good. And the other thing I like about the garden is please visit it in the winter. I mean, I would suggest if you're going to go visit, visit at least four times a year. So you get the idea about um, what different plants look like at different times of the year. Well, this has been That's a wonderful class. Are there any more questions where we have about 10 more minutes? We'd be happy to answer. If anyone wants to type a question in chat, otherwise we'll adjourn for the day and see you at our next class. Yeah, I'd like to put a plug out for our next class is Shade Gardening, gardening which is this Saturday, November 7th and November 14th from 9 to 10.30. So you can go to our public website to register and you'll be registered for both classes. So this Saturday from 9 to 1030. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I don't see any more questions. So I just want to um, thank Debbie and Bobby and Ruth for their time today. If you can help me by using your little um, icon and give them a round of applause. Uh, thank you so much and everyone just have a wonderful rest of your week. Uh, we hope that Wednesday hump day that talking about succulents was inspiring for you and we look forward to seeing you at a class in the near future. Bye-bye. <laughs>